the dark shadow of space leans over us. We are mindful that the darkness of greed, exploitation, and hatred also lengthens its shadow over our small planet, Earth. As our ancestors feared death and evil and all the dark powers of winter, we fear the darkness of war, discrimination, and selfishness that may doom us and our planet to an eternal winter. The pale mare, the shrouded lord, the bite of winter's kiss. He has many names and many faces. In a Game of Thrones, Daenerys Chapter 3, Jorah the Andal says to Daenerys, The common people pray for rain, healthy children, and a summer that never ends. Jorah states this with a dismissive implication towards the common people, but the common people have collective wisdom, no doubt, passed down for millennia. It is obvious why they pray for rain, obvious why they would pray for healthy children, and considering the supernaturally unbalanced seasons of their world, it is obvious why they would prefer a never-ending summer over any winter. But ultimately what they fear is not the winter itself, but what the winter brings with it. And no, I do not mean the others. Well, I do, but not exactly. It's more about what the others help to represent. Often we get very bogged down in the details. What do the others want? Why are they coming now at this time? What is the ultimate mystery of their existence? But the truth is, none of that actually matters. As I always say, stories that resonate often resonate for simple reasons. The common people fear the winter because the winter brings death. The winter is death. The other coming forth from the darkness to snuff out all light. Kind of phoning it in, don't you think? Stop using that hokey voice. Organism 916, look, this is a very serious topic, okay? Some drama is required. Death is only an issue for primitive biological life forms such as yourself. We of the Trollion Empire do not experience death as you call it. Hmm, afraid so, Organism. Your molecules will fully dematerialize someday. No, uh uh It's the second law of thermodynamics. Isolated systems always evolve towards the maximum state of entropy. It's one of the fundamental laws of the universe. Your universe, maybe. Hey, what is this field thing? Oh, you like it? You kept penetrating my dimension, so I installed a secondary force field. Doesn't seem to be working properly, however. I can still hear you for some reason. Are you kidding me? This is bullcrap. You're suppressing my... <sighs> sweet, sweet silence. Some, like Organism 9186 over here, have a hard time accepting the fact that they are indeed going to die. Understandable, of course, given that it's not easy to consider that your consciousness may one day not be because of this, often people try to avoid the thought altogether. They do everything they can to slow the inevitable process. But when the winter comes and the darkness gathers, no one can hide from the cold. When the common folk pray for a summer that never ends, a world without winter, what they are really praying for is a world without death, a world without decay, Lots of things can kill you, however, as Jorah mentioned. The common folk pray for rain as well. No rain, no drinking water, no crops. That is death as well. So why don't the others take the form of windy drought monsters that dry out the land rather than freezing it? Why is the idea of a long winter more terrifying than a long drought? Let's actually try to unpack this. In the real world, people have been living in almost unlivable northern climates for thousands of years. Prehistoric Alaska was inhabited by humans more than 20,000 years ago. The climate is quite different in Alaska than in most places in the world, obviously. For instance, roughly from May 11th to July 31st, the summer sun never completely sets. And even more interesting, there are also two months of darkness approximately November 18th to January 22nd. 
These long stretches of darkness and daylight occur at both poles. The closer to the poles one is, the more extreme. Imagine what these events must have been like for early humans experiencing them for the first time. As they say, what we know is a drop in the ocean. But back then, the nature of the world was an even greater mystery, and a terrifying one at that. Humans are biologically programmed through our long evolutionary history to respond to our environment in certain ways. The sun tells us when to wake, when to sleep. It gives us light to hunt and forage during the day, warms our bodies from the chill of the night. The vitamin D we receive from the sun has even been proven to be essential to our mental health. And the sun is always there, always has been. Day after day, it rises. But what if suddenly one day it stopped? And instead of getting warmer, it just got colder and colder for days, for weeks, for months. Now close your eyes and imagine waking up to what should be daylight and seeing only darkness, not knowing when it would end or if the sun would even ever come up again. That is the horror that George is evoking in A Song of Ice and Fire. When it doesn't rain, you gather water. When the ponds and rivers go dry, you migrate. When there is only darkness and cold, you have no choice but to die. Oh, sh**. Bullsh**. Complete dribble. Oh no, how'd you unmute yourself? If a little cold is so tough for humans, then how did ancient man survive? Obviously you couldn't survive because you're full of soy. Computer mute organism. organism. Wait, I'm a computer Good question, though. I asked you guys to imagine waking up expecting daylight to find only darkness. Obviously, it would be terrifying, and if you were alone, you would probably die. But as our good friend Eddard Stark once said, when the winter comes, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. The tribalistic nature of humankind has always been essential to our survival. We are social animals, and we need each other to survive. I imagine that early humans survived the same way that humans always survive, together. And it was probably terrible and awful, but it would have been that much more so if they had to face it alone. In A Song of Ice and Fire, a big part of what winter represents is the fear of something coming, which you cannot stop. It will take what it wants and you are at its mercy. It is something that is beyond all human intervention. Except, in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's not. Because we know that they fought it before. Together. And perhaps it doesn't really matter that winter wasn't eternally defeated, because it is the struggle against winter, the rage against the dying light that makes us who we are. A world without winter, a world without death, what would such a thing actually mean? In my opinion, a never-ending summer and a never-ending winter are both curses. They are both subversions of the natural order. If we suggested for a moment that Melisandre's religion was real, and R'hllor was the true creator god, locked in eternal conflict with the god of consumption, the Great Other, then it would suggest that it is in fact their conflict that actually sustains the natural order. Without one, the other is meaningless. Without his opposite, who is R'hllor? That is the nature of dualism. This type of belief system implies that both halves are fundamental. The idea of dualistic cosmology is unfathomably ancient. The concept has always spoken to mankind. I think this has to do with the fact that mankind itself has a dualistic nature. Each person has the potential for great evil and great good. An essential self and a shadow self. This is of course a Jungian idea. The shadow self, as you may know, essentially refers to the dark unconscious, the aspects of one's personality which remain hidden, unidentified by the ego, all the hidden desires and bad thoughts. The shadow is as much a part of you as your essential self and should never be ignored or repressed. True enlightenment comes not from ridding oneself of the shadow, which is futile anyway, 
but accepting the shadow as a part of oneself and learning to live with it in balance, in harmony. When the shadow comes forward, it needs to be acknowledged because it won't go away. Melisandre claims that shadows are creatures of the light, but I think she's wrong. How would we know light without shadow, without darkness? It is better to say that light and dark are inextricably a part of the same whole. Characters in A Song of Ice and Fire who attempt to go against the natural order all seem to pay a great price. Bloodraven is bound to a tree in a cave he can never leave. The undying live like parasites, draining the potent auras of those who enter their house. Melisandre speaks of agony, ecstasy, and pain as the result of her spells maintaining her youth. And also the act of extending one's life through skin changing another human is repeatedly referred to as an abomination. Since Martin consistently implies that it is wrong to go against the natural order, it only follows that anything that defies the natural order of life and death is wrong. Though the common folk may dream, in reality, a world without winter, a world where nothing dies and the sun never sets, is no world made for mortal men. This video is boring. Jesus, how the- This video is boring. You just think you're so smart. Well, if you're so enlightened, then why are you here living in another dimension instead of working with your fellow man fixing the world's problems? You know what, Organism? It's because I'm scared. Just like everybody else, we're all just scared. Everything's just so insane right now. Such a mess. Global warming. The pandemic. It just feels so... Helpless. I can't help but feel like those primitive humans encountering the northern darkness for the first time. Wondering if there is a way out of this. Are we all doomed? Is this winter ever going to end? Is the sun ever going to come up again? The truth is, I don't know, organism. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I can do. I don't know what anybody can do. I hope that answers your question. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. You got boring again. Also, this video sucks. Computer reject no. form. Rejecting foreign organism. She should have done that sooner. A Song of Ice and Fire, more so than almost any fantasy series that I've ever read, has an eerily realistic portrayal of death. I mean, other than the fact that people come back from the dead, of course. In A Song of Ice and Fire, death is often not glorious. Most of the time, it's ugly and horrific. But it's a part of our natural cycle as living beings. And although that fact can be hard to accept for a lot of us, it's still true for all of us. Valar Mogulis. It's Quinn. If you enjoy my commentary, you should totally check out my book. I wrote it myself. It's kind of a scary story about witches. It's got some mystery in there. It's in a fantasy setting. I really like it a lot. It's in graphic novel form. Link in the description.